What do you think about models? If you say a model, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Chances are initially it's going to be one of these things. Uh, try to be nice and gender neutral here and uh, have a couple of uh, different uh, runway models here, or model cars models of the uh, solar system, that type of thing, okay? Obviously, we're not talking about that type of thing. We're talking about experimental models or models in science. Um, models got about 12 definitions, if you look at it, uh, under a, uh, a noun in the uh, dictionary. So the one that sort of is most pertinent to what we're going to be studying is this, sort of a simplified representation of a system, for example, a biological system, or a phenomenon, uh, really with any hypotheses that are required to describe the system or explain the phenomenon, often mathematically, sometimes experimentally. Okay, so that's really what a, what a model is. We're trying to take a, uh, a real system and simplify it so that we can do some you know, further investigation of it. There's all kinds of different models that are pertinent to biological research. And these are just some examples. I'm not going to talk about too much about these things. Molecular modeling, uh, you take known features of, uh, of uh, molecules, micromolecules, macromolecules, their, sort of their uh, ionic bonds and so on. And uh, you can predict the behavior of these molecules under various conditions, chemical conditions or uh, electromagnetic conditions, how, how they're going to behave. Mechanistic modeling, so you can take a biological description and break it down in terms of different constituent parts and mechanisms. For example, and we'll keep coming back to orthopedics, or the extensor mechanism. If you apply a force to the extensor mechanism, you can break it down. What's the effect on the quads? What's the effect on the patella? What's the effect on the uh, patellar tendon, the tibial tubercle, that type of thing, okay? Uh, statistical modeling, prediction of any outcomes based on any sort of a defined set of known probability distributions. Okay, so all these are potentially pertinent and relevant in uh, biological research. Uh, mathematical models get a little bit closer to what um, you know we would do a little bit more frequently when you uh, represent any essential aspects, known aspects of a system um, by sort of mathematical uh, formulae, mathematical algorithms, or al uh, algorithms, so that you can use it in a simplified form. So examples would be finite ele element analysis. Okay, you done some measurements and you know how certain bone responds to certain stresses and strains and you can translate that into a computerized mathematical model so you don't have to do it anymore. You can just go to the finite element analysis and say if I apply a force X, what's going to happen to it? So it gets rid of the sort of the observational aspect of things. Uh, you can model movement of uh, interacting cell populations. You put um, uh, for example, some osteoblasts and osteoclasts in a petri dish and what happens to them together and you can observe it over time and make predictions in terms of what's going to happen um, uh, based on certain algorithms. Same thing with cancer invasion. If you put uh, some cancer cells in a certain tissue, you can observe what happens to them over time and make uh, predictions and make that into a mathematical model. So examples here, uh, for example, of putting hip resurfacing, um, you can uh, observe from biomechanical testing of that what happens. You can measure the stresses and strains and devise these um, finite element models to predict what would happen in uh, subsequent experiments. Uh, same type of thing here for um, assessing, predicting what's going to happen if you uh, fix fractures, okay? If you uh, compare the amount of uh, strain, the amount of movement between two fracture ends by the amount of gap, okay? And you do several studies, observe what happens, and if you find that that ratio is less than 2%, you get bone formation all the way up to um, uh, greater than 10%, you get granulation tissue formation, you can really just use that mathematical, um, that mathematical model, that mathematical calculation and algorithm to predict what's going to happen rather than needing to observe it over and over again. So these all differ from experimental models which really rely on direct observation. Okay, so you're going to do an experiment, you're going to look at the results, and you're going to make inferences based on those results about the system uh, of interest. And we're going to talk briefly about uh, some in vitro uh, modeling, in vivo modeling, and some biomechanical modeling, and I think that's going to provide a segue into what we're going to talk about tomorrow as well. So in vitro models really refers to a technique of performing any sort of given procedure outside a, an entire organism. Okay? So it can be tissues, it can be organs, it can be down to the cellular level or subcellular level, proteins, biomolecules, anything that does not involve an entire organism is in vitro work, okay? Um, and this is really ideal in some circumstances if you're looking at very simple, um, uh, you know, biological mechanisms, if you're looking at specific, um, uh, you know, molecular reactions, if you're looking at uh, various different simple procedures and you really want to come down to the nuts and bolts of it. And the reason it's good is because there's fewer interacting uh, variables, okay? So you take out the, you know, the issue of the entire organism. 
but that may not reflect what happens at the entire organism level. So you may make one observation in a petri dish and you put the exact same thing in an organism and it all falls to hell, right? You may find that, uh, that uh, you know, drug X has a fantastic effect on cancer cells in a petri dish. You give drug X to a, a mouse with that exact same cancer and it'll have no effect whatsoever. So the biological complexity plays a role when you get into the in vivo level, and that's why you have to bring it along stepwise, okay? The ones that are valid in vitro then go to the in vitro work, uh, in vivo work, all right? So the classic example of in vitro work is cell culture. So you get cells that are dissociated from some normal tissue, uh, plated in, uh, in, um, uh, in medium and grown up, and you can manipulate them however you want. And uh, you look at various aspects of uh, molecular or cellular biology, okay? So you can grow osteoblasts, such as on this um, biomaterial, different, uh, different clinical applications of osteoblast cell culture. You can uh, do tissue engineering, certainly. You can make bones, which is, uh, you know, what people are trying to do all around the world. Uh, look at gene therapy, uh, for example, using VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, to try to promote healing of non-unions. You can, uh, you know, inflect these cells with, um, with uh, VEGF. You can put promoters in at the VEGF site, all kinds of things in order to try to stimulate healing. You can look at cell-cell interactions. You can put the osteoblasts in culture. You can put in some wear debris, and you see what happens to them. Various different applications of osteoblast cell cultures. Chondrocytes, another cell, obviously, a lot of us are interested in. Uh, these often require some pretty specialized culture conditions. So if you're thinking about looking at chondrocytes, uh, you have to you know, really uh, look through the literature and say, well, how are these really uh, grown? Because they're very different. They have a different uh, phenotypic appearance if they're grown flat in a Petri dish or if they're grown, for example, suspended in alginate beads, okay, which cause them to more typically resemble their normal phenotype. So different applications, in, uh, once again, include tissue engineering, um, looking at the effects of you know, extracellular matrix molecules, and growth factors, uh, looking at uh, the effect of um, uh, mechanical forces on uh, cell metabolism. That's something that has sort of become apparent over the last, you know, probably 10 or 15 years that mechanotransductors or, or mechanoreceptors actually present in cells um, really can influence their cellular behavior based on the external mechanical forces. This is a big thing recently, mesenchymal stem cells, okay. Uh, this is a, uh, some work done looking at the effect of um, uh, and the fate of stem cells that are injected in, in skin wounds try to improve wound healing. So these are all uh, mesenchymal stem cells, these green cells that have been um, uh, uh, taken from a, a green fluorescent protein positive rat, a transgenic rat. So uh, we can track these cells. We inject it into an animal that is not green fluorescent protein positive, and we can follow what happens to these cells. And these cells have been used in sort of tissue engineering cell therapy to try to enhance uh, healing of musculoskeletal tissues. So these are a very promising source of precursor cells for a lot of musculoskeletal tissues, and uh, they can be induced to differentiate into various things, osteoblasts, chondrocytes, various different lineages, and more recently a lot of pluripotent cells have been found in skin, fat, muscle, wherever you read, you know, in the, in the uh, newspaper, it seems like every month there's some new discovery coming up with respect to these uh, pluripotent stem cells. Um, an important aspect uh, that is very sort of relevant to any orthopedic practices or tissue engineering because um, uh, sort of a lot of musculoskeletal tissues tend to degrade with time, obviously, cartilage, intervertebral disc, to name a couple. There's a lot of interest in trying to regenerate these tissues, looking at uh, combining uh, extracellular matrix, specific cellular components, and growth factors. So that's yet another aspect of in vitro work um, that uh, come up with relevant models. Okay, so in vivo models, that would obviously be the next step. Once you've found some relevant uh, findings in your in vitro work, you would next go to in vivo work before you're going to go to a clinical trial in humans, as Mo mentioned, okay? So these are really animal models of disease, uh, experimentation on a whole living organism. And as I said, because they involve a lot more complex biological systems, you may be very disappointed if you found something that's very promising in in vitro studies once you take it to an animal model, you may find that it works not at all, okay? Don't dismay, okay? That happens all the time. Um, the important thing about in vivo work is that the results that you see are often a more accurate sort of uh, representation of what really happens in a biological system, okay? So if you get a positive result in a uh, in vivo model, I think you're very, very... Uh, you know, really on the right track toward getting to some type of, uh, you know, clinical trial and uh, potentially human intervention, okay? 
So just talk about a couple of genetic models, okay? So this is the, the fruit fly, the thing you hear about all the time, Drosophila. Uh, these are very important and uh, very attractive to a lot of people that do genetic work because they have uh, very short generation times. They grow like crazy and they die like crazy. Um, you can very easily induce mutations in them, and you can really track those mutations. So if they get like a third eye growing out of the center of their head or something like that, you know, you can really see that, and it does so easily, okay? So really they used to uh, really study developmental pathways in a lot of, um, uh, in a lot of so some orthopedic surgeons around that are very interested in sort of uh, in development and use that as their, uh, as their model of interest. Uh, the mouse is sort of the most common um, animal that's used, really, and they've got a very high degree of homology to humans, really about 99% of DNA is identical to ours, okay? So what you find in mice often can be translated into humans. They're uh, cheap, relatively speaking, easy to store, and uh, they reproduce like crazy as well, so, um, so very easy to handle and, uh, and uh, use for several experiments. There's all kinds of different mouse models and way of generating uh, sort of novel mouse models to study disease. So uh, inbred, uh, inbred mice, you know, you get mutations in some mice and you get them to breed together, brother and sister, having fun together and so on. And you can get big mutant strains that happen. So this is the typical one, nodskid mice, uh, non-obese diabetic, severe combined immunodeficiency. So they have essentially no immune system. The attractive thing about them is you can take human cells and you can stick them in these mice and they, they really won't get rejected. And you can do all kinds of tests on human cells and human tissue. Okay, so they're a very, very valuable strain of mice. Transgenic mouse models, so you can insert a foreign gene and all the, all the, um, the cells or maybe cells in some particular area will express that gene. So for example, you can insert an oncogene uh, and promote a region and it can induce cancer to form. Or you can put, as we've done, green fluorescent protein in, so you have these green mice or green rats and then you can take cells out of them, put it in another rat, and you can see what belongs, you know, which cells belong to that rat that you've put it in and, and, uh, and not. Uh, you can knock out genes, so you can take normal genes and get rid of them. For example, uh, the lit mutation, which is um, insulin-like growth factor deficient, uh, or in, insulin-like growth factor deficient mouse, so you get these mouse mice that are homozygous, and the lit means little, these tiny, tiny little mice, like mice are small anyways, these are like, like a quarter the size of normal mice, and they're important for studying the effect, for example, of IGF on tumor development. Uh, larger uh, mammal models, not that rats are big, but they're bigger than mice, okay? And then the uh, larger ones, dogs, pigs, sheep. Um, if you're gonna use these as models, uh, you gotta be prepared, they're very expensive, uh, often difficult to house, and wherever you're working, they may very well not you know, have the capability of housing them. So you really got to check out what your animal colony can use. Um, the advantage to these is that you can really study entire organ systems and study them quite easily. So if you've got a living animal, what you can do is you can certainly look at, uh, at radiographic results. You can do functional imaging, PET scans. You can do functional MRI scans, all kind of stuff in the living animal. Some invasive monitoring. If you kill them, then you can look at sort of histology, immunohistochemistry, biomechanics. If you, you know, do some intervention to look at fracture healing, there's all kinds of things that you can examine in these, uh, in these larger models. So just a couple of words about biomechanical models. Uh, you know, we're, we're pretty unique in orthopedic surgery because we put so many implants in people. Probably more than any other specialty, maybe, um, except for ophthalmologists. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really what, what we do. You know, we put in plates, people put in implants, uh, hip replacements, knee replacements, and, and that's the majority of what we do. So compounding that is that our system, the musculoskeletal system, is really faced with constant and repetitive stresses, not only from the external environment, but our internal environment, muscular forces and so on. So these things tend to wear down, okay? So the mechanical properties of whatever, whatever we put in are really, really important, okay? So any biomechanical models may not actually involve any biological material at all, okay? So this is uh, some study we uh, did looking at um, uh, composite bones, which are an epoxy resin glass, which is virtually identical to normal cortical bone, and it's filled with this polyurethane foam, which is virtually identical to normal cancellous bone. The biomechanical properties are identical. So we've got this synthetic bone. We've got a, uh, a uh, uncemented stem, a press fit stem connecting to a tumor prosthesis, and we've put that in and we're torquing it to failure to see how the initial rotational stability is, okay? So there's no biology really whatsoever in this, but it has immense biological implications, okay? 
Um, other types of biomechanical studies, biomechanical models that can be done include sort of fracture fixation and healing. This is the same type of, uh, same type of bone with a distal femoral fracture that's plated, being tested to failure and axi axial loading. Uh, looking at failure of arthroplasty components. Uh, in terms of biological tissues, different techniques of uh, tendon repair, comparing the uh, strength, the pullout strength, uh, looking at wound healing, wear of bearing surfaces, all kinds of different models that can be used biomechanically. The preclinical model, any of these are preclinical models. However, the term sort of preclinical model more so refers to uh, what uh, uh, we were talking about a little bit earlier, looking at drug testing, okay? So you get various different drugs that are, uh, that are germane to, to orthopedics or anything else. So chemotherapy agents, bisphosphonates, anti-inflammatories, antibiotics really need to go undergo very, very rigorous preclinical testing in animals to determine if they're safe to go into phase one trials in humans. So last two slides, what makes a good model? Um, you know, the things I would think of would be something that's obviously very simple and easy to use, okay? You don't want to have something that uh, you've got to go through 50 different steps uh, manipulating, um, you know, cells in culture because nobody's going to use it. It's too, too cumbersome, okay? Reproducible. You want to say, hey, Joe, try this. It works great. And Joe can take your list of five instructions and, and reproduce it well, okay? Uh, very generalizable. You want to be able to uh, translate that on from your animal model to humans, right? You don't want to do something that's, that's very, very specifically unique to mice or rats and capitalize on that because it will have no biological relevance whatsoever to humans. Um, in addition to that, it really reflects that biological system of interest that you're looking at and really addresses a really relevant clinical question, all right? Now, if you're into looking at a model, you want to design a model, you've got some clinical problem that you want to, uh, want to address, I would caution you, first of all, look through the literature. See what's there, first of all, okay? Because designing your own model, coming up with a new model, an animal model or any in vitro model, it's very, very time consuming. You can sit there for months and months learning how to grow cells and it doesn't work and you realize somebody else tried the exact same thing and it didn't work, okay? So you can save yourself a lot of heartache. Very expensive, can be very wasteful, and oftentimes, as I said, you try it for months and months and can be fruitless, all right? So, Always worthwhile, look at the literature, see if any model exists and use it. There's no, no shame in using somebody else's model, that's what they're there for, okay?